Welcome to worship. We have come to approach the throne of grace and to receive mercy and renewal. May God fill our hearts with love as we worship and have fellowship together. A hearty welcome to all. We also want to welcome Eileen Coots, and we're glad that you're here, and thank you for filling in. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, be sure that you fill out the little yellow card for the visitors. It's in, in the pew. And Pastor Stephen, if you didn't know, is out of the office this coming week, and we do have Eileen here today, so we're glad of that. If you need a personal visit or need something, just call the office. Uh, Vine t-shirts. If you haven't noticed, there are some sign-up sheets out there. There's a picture of the Vine t-shirts inside by the um, water fountain in there and check that out. Be sure you get one. They're $15, no matter what size you get. And pre-orders are being taken through October 5th, so be sure to fill that out. You can attach your check to the form, uh, $15, and put it in the little blue box in the back. We do need some scripture readers, and we also need people to sign up for Fellowship Hour. Both of those sign-up sheets are, again, in the... Uh, Fellowship Hall, please be sure and sign up for that. Look at the dates that are available. I'm just kind of going through some. You can read most of these on your own. Um, branching out for September. Again, we're still doing, I think probably this is the last Sunday for Shelter, for Shelter Me Nebraska. This provides temporary foster care for pets of abuse victims we are collecting items to aid in sheltering pets and items to assist the victims leaving abusive situations. The collection box, if you saw it as you came in, is right in the back. Be sure to put those there. Thank you. I believe that uh, Anissa has something else that she would like to announce. I would like to let everybody know that our Sunday school is going to be um, contributing to or working on the crop walk, which will be in Lincoln on October 9th. And our Sunday school is going to gather uh, donations next Sunday, uh, October 2nd, 
and on October 9th. And they're going to be standing in the narthex before church with some buckets. And they're going to be asking for your change. So between now and October 9th, please gather up your change and bring it with you next week and October 9th. And that will be money that will go for the crop walk. On October 9th, our Sunday school will be walking around our neighborhood. Um, and they are going to be learning about the crop walk the crock walk, <laughs> crop walk as well in Sunday school and uh, learning about how hunger affects people in different parts of the world as well as here. So please help them uh, by your donations next Sunday, October 2nd and October 9th with change. Thank you. Let us join our hearts together as we to the call to worship. We are community. We have come to worship. We trust the one who was, is now, and forever will be. Our trust is in the one who exhibits extensive love and is calling us to do the same. We follow the one who never breaks covenant. We follow the one who allows us to feed the hungry and to seek justice. We raise the spirit that spans the ages. Amen. I believe you're supposed to stand.
join me in our invocation. Shield and defender, how worthy you are of the praises we bring. We sing of your mercy. We tell of your glory. We speak of your greatness. We need only speak and you listen. You are our comforter and our strength. You enfold us in your protection through faith in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I don't think this one's working, has it? Um, but it's not working. I'll switch to that one. We would like to also acknowledge that um, our children have new shirts when they play the bells. And that was something that um, the niece of Jenny had created for us. So we are very thankful for that.
Our scripture reading today is from Psalms 91, the contemporary English version. Live under the protection of God Most High and stay in the shadow of God All-Powerful. Then you will say to the Lord, you are my fortress, my place of safety. You are my God and I trust you. The Lord will keep you safe from secret traps and deadly diseases. He will spread his wings over you and keep you secure. His faithfulness is like a shield or a city wall. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or arrows during the day. And you won't fear diseases that strike in the dark or sudden disaster at noon. You will not be harmed, though thousands fall all around you. And with your own eyes, you will see the punishment of the wicked. The Lord Most High is your fortress. Run to him for safety, and no terrible disasters will strike you or your home. God will command his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will carry you in their arms, and you won't hurt your feet on the stones. You will overpower the strongest lions and the most deadly snakes. The Lord says, if you love me and truly know, truly know who I am, I will rescue you and keep you safe. When you are in trouble, call out to me. I will answer and be there to protect and honor you. You will live a long life and see my saving power. This is the scripture for today. May we hear the word of God in it for us. Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. I'm going to put this down. Maybe you can hear me better. Let's try that. Okay. Well, I have to tell you, I really struggled and struggled to stick with the lectionary scripture for today. I was greatly tempted to select one of my favorite passages, which happens to be story passages, ones like uh, the saga of Jacob or Queen Esther or even uh, a healing that Jesus did. But here we are today with today's lectionary, Psalm 91. At the first reading of this psalm, we read absolute statements. The Lord will keep you from secret traps and deadly diseases. He will spread his wings over you and keep you secure. You won't need to worry about dangers at night or day. You won't need to fear deadly diseases or sudden disasters. You will not be harmed, even though thousands fall all around you. No terrible disasters will strike you or your home. God will command his angels to protect you wherever you go. And then the psalm closes with, the Lord says, if you love me and truly know who I am, I will rescue you and keep you safe. When you are in trouble, call out to me. I will answer. I'll be there to protect you and honor you. Now these closing words, if we don't uh, take them within context, can lay a guilt trip on us. If bad things happen to us, does that mean we don't love God? We don't really know who God is. It appears we must take the blame if we experience difficulties in life. Let's go back to that absolute statement. The Lord will keep you from deadly diseases. Well, we know we've been in a pandemic for more than two years and over a million people died does that mean none of them loved God? And hundreds of people, including children, have been killed by mass murderers. Can we honestly believe none of them love God? And natural disasters like floods 
and hurricanes. We know homes are destroyed. People have died. And then we look at the disciples, Jesus' chosen ones. And we know because they love God, Jesus, so much, most of them endured beatings, prison, and even martyrism or martyrdom. They did that because they were carrying out Jesus' mission. And Jesus certainly loved God. That's a given. But he was beaten and crucified. Curious. Very curious. God protects us from all difficulties. Then why do we have psalms of lament? Psalms that express feelings of discouragement depression, fear, anger, danger, fear of abandonment of God, and fear of death. The psalmist in Psalm 13 cries out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you let my enemy triumph over me? Well, obviously, something here isn't quite right. We must be missing something. And so, let's look again. This time, let's use exegesis. Now, isn't that a fun word, exegesis? You know, I think it sounds like exit Jesus, but that's not it. Exegesis is just a Greek word that means using resources like biblical commentaries and various translations of the Bible, books by biblical scholars to guide us in broadening our understanding and perspectives on a specific scriptural passage. So having used these resources, let me take you back to the scripture and get a better understanding than what just seemed obvious from reading those words. The psalm, the psalmist, is not saying, life is good, no problems here. Instead, he's enthusiastically and sincerely sharing his experience of God's faithfulness. He's sharing his deep trust in God and he invites us to also experience God's faithfulness. So with that in mind, let's look at that opening again. He's saying, live under the protection of God Most High and stay in the shadow of God All-Powerful. And then you will be able to say, Lord, you are my fortress, my place of safety. God, I trust you. The psalmist isn't saying there's a guarantee against, against all possible dangers and threats, but he is proclaiming that in all circumstances, even the terrible ones, God can be trusted to be there. Nothing can separate us from the God, the God that we come to through Christ Jesus. Now we understand this is a psalm of praise and gratitude. The psalmist trusts the Lord in all things, including beyond his earthly life. That's exciting. We've moved from reading a psalm that we think something just isn't right here to understanding that God is with us in all things. We know God is with us even in death. But death is not something we really like to think about. As Christians, we believe in eternal life, 
but most of us, raise your hand. Are you really anxious to start your eternal life? Anyone? <laughs> well, I, I'm with you. I'm not anxious. Part of it is because of the fear of the unknown. When I was in fourth grade, I wanted to dive off the diving board. And I knew the theory. You dive off, you go in deep water, and you come back up to the surface. But I was a little bit afraid to test that theory. And so I got the lifeguard to watch very carefully. So when I dove off and went in the water, if I didn't come up, she would come and rescue me. So the unknown is a little scary. And we want to continue to live with our friends and our family. And I'm speaking from experience. Bob and I really wanted him to have a lot more life with his earthly friends and family. And the doctors wanted him to have more life. They worked desperately to keep Bob alive. An aneurysm developed after Bob's surgery to eradicate the pancreatic cancer. It was a pseudo aneurysm, and I thought, well, <laughs> I guess that means it wasn't a real one. But what it really meant was it was not contained within an artery, and therefore it could move around. The bleeding was life-threatening. They decided the only thing to do was go back and do surgery again. But it was so risky, we had to affirm we were standing by Bob's medical directives of no extreme measures. They weren't sure he'd come through, but he did. We felt so blessed. But then the aneurysm moved and bled again, a second surgery, and then a third surgery. And the doctor came back after that third surgery on the aneurysm and said, we took a last ditch effort. I cut off the artery. It no longer provides blood to the liver. The liver can live with just one source of blood but it may not like it. And I said, well, when is it time to just say enough is enough? And he said, well, certainly not now. We just saved his life. The liver did not like it. And he developed an abscess that was infected with bacteria highly resistant to antibiotics. He had a drain tube inserted by another surgery. It seemed to be working, but then another abscess and another abscess. Seven abscesses, and they said, we can put in more drains. Bob was in so much pain and had been for four months that he looked at me and I thought, okay, we've gone, come to that point where we said no extreme measures. It was time to live up to our medical directive. <sighs> that was really hard, knowing that meant Bob would soon be living his eternal life. It's excruciating to live without Bob. Many of you have had losses, deaths. You know that pain. You know how hard it is to live with it. But the good news is God is with us in all situations. And I can truly say, God is my refuge and my strength. 
He doesn't take away the pain, but he does enable me to live through my pain and to grow from it. I've done a lot of reading in these five months since Bob began his eternal life. I've learned things. I realize, you know, we're taught from a very young age about first aid. We're taught about what to do in an emergency, but we are not taught how to deal with grief. And some of the things we've been taught are not helpful, like if you're going to cry, just go into your room. Don't let us see it. Grief needs to be expressed. And so these are four things that really are changing my life in the way I deal with grief and interact with people grieving. The end of one year is not magical. The pain does not just disappear. In fact, they have found year two, three, or more are even harder than the first year. <laughs> that was not encouraging to find out, but it did reassure me that if I'm still grieving, I'm not just wallowing, it's part of the process. And then an expert, a leading expert, according to uh, what I've read, uh, often answers the question, how long will I grieve? By asking his own question. Well, how long will your loved one be dead? And I thought, huh, I don't like that at all. But then I realized, yeah, it's a process. There's no point in trying to hurry. It's just going to be with me. So I need to learn how to live with it in a healthy way. The pain will get less, I do believe. But the hole in my heart will always be there. That's true for all of us who have lost people. We grieve, and it's okay. We don't need to suck it up. And I also learned that I've been doing it wrong. When I, when I am with a person that's grieving, I, I feel responsible to help them feel better. And I might say something like, well, she's in a better place, or she's not in pain. Well, that's intellectually correct, but it's not helpful to the heart. And so I read that it's better just to listen, let the griever talk, or maybe say something like, this must be awfully hard. I'm trying to learn to remember I'm not the fixer. I can't fix the griever, but I can listen. And it's important for the griever to be able to share memories and stories, even if they do it through tears. And here's something for you men. This was amazing to me. And remember, it's not from me, it's from the experts. You've been taught incorrectly when you've been taught, suck it up. Even men need to share their pain. If, they, if you need to shout, go in the shower and shout. If you need to cry, cry. And you do need to cry. Studies have shown that the brain releases chemicals during crying that helps us to heal. And if grief is held inside, it can become destructive and harmful to the griever or even to the people around because the person might lash out in their grief. This is a journey I did not want to take, but all of us, are going to take that journey. And so it's important that we do try to start learning how do we grieve 
in healthy ways. And then remember, even though it's common to doubt our faith in God at these times, God's always there. And those closing verses in Psalm, God says, when you love me, we're connected. He's always there, but if we don't open ourselves to God, we don't feel that connection. God created, created us for relationships, relationships with each other, relationships with God. And this relationship with God leads to eternal life. This psalmist, even though he wrote these words many years ago, still touch our lives. It tells us the depth of our relationship with God is very important, especially in times of trouble and grief. The psalmist encourages us to grow deeper in that relationship. Even if you can't feel God's presence, God is there. And that's great news. God desires a relationship with us. God made us for relationships. We are privileged to be God's people. Thanks be to God. Amen.
kind of out of the usual order today. Let us pray. God of our lives, we thank you that there is no place we can go that you are not there with us. Even in darkness, when our eyesight is limited, you see clearly. Nothing about us is hidden from you, yet you have promised that nothing in all creation can separate us from your love shown through Christ Jesus. Forgive us when we take our relationship with you for granted. Forgive us when we take our relationships with others for granted. We realized during the depths of COVID how important being in community with others was to our well-being. Many of us are still suffering from anxiety developed during COVID. Be with all that are still suffering with anxiety, recovery, not just from COVID, but from other angst in their lives. We are gathered today as a community of Vine Congregational there are burdens and struggles weighing us down, some of which are known, but many that are unknown. You know our needs. Please encourage us and give us the unexpected blessings that we might feel your love in very concrete ways. Even when we are hurting, guide our eyes and hearts to become your hands and feet as we reach out to others that are hurting. We are called to be family. And as family, we unite as we pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to participate in offering. Giver of all things good, with pleasure and thanksgiving, we offer back to you a small portion of time, talents, and resources you have given us. Guide us in offering more of ourselves to you, for it is our desire to be reflections of your love and grace. Amen. Let us join in the blessing. Loving God, teach us to trust you to supply all that we need. We're given our offerings 
not because we must, but because it is our privilege. We rejoice we have this small way of showing our gratitude that you love and care for us. Thank you for accepting our offerings. Amen. And now, God sends us out from this place with hope and the word of life that we will live and share with others. God empowers us to live in community with our friends, relatives, and all those we meet. Let us practice greater love and trust as we live life this week. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.
can do it. Right